Uh, all right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I am Ray Briggs, and I will be chairing this session. I am a person of like, if you a white person of if you can't figure out my gender, that's great because I hate to be the last to know anything um, in a, a university office with some unpacked boxes in it, uh, wearing glasses and a shirt with uh, pictures of dinosaurs on it and a jacket. Uh, I am very pleased to be introducing uh, Lori Gruen, who is a prolific author uh, who is um, most recently has a forthcoming book on uh, animal, it's animal crisis. Uh, yes. Um, it's actually out now. Yeah. Uh, which is actually out now, uh, co-authored with Alice Crary. Um, she works on practical ethics and political philosophy uh, that focuses on issues that impact those often overlooked in traditional ethical investigations. So yeah, welcome, Laurie. Thank you. Um, so I'm just calling the paper Species Trouble, um, and I'm going to talk through it with you. Um, but before I do, I'm a white presenting person with gray hair. It's long gray hair. I'm wearing glasses, and I'm sitting in a fairly bland looking room with some bird posters behind me on the wall. Um, I'm so honored to be presenting this year on a topic that's been vexing me for a while. And this is a work in progress. Um, but what I get right in this paper, I owe completely to Shelley Tremaine. My discussions with her um, and her firm but patient feedback continues to have just a profound effect on my thinking. Um, there's going to be stuff that I get wrong, though, so my gratitude to Shelley might not be welcome where I get things wrong, at least not yet. Um, I'm working on it, and I really do look forward to um, all of your critical feedback, um, because so I'll leave as much time as I can for our conversation. Um, I've already learned tremendously from earlier conversations in the conference, and I'm looking forward um, to for future sessions as well. So. One of the key categorical divides that naturalizes power relations is the divide between humans and the human species, so-called, um, and other animal species. And this divide is doubly troubling um, as it divides two so-called natural categories, usually called species, um, and then elevates one over a whole bunch of others. Um, human as a species gets elevated over all of the other animal species. Um, and there are multiple meanings of the concept of species and whether a particular population or organisms, a group of organisms is classified as a species may change even quickly. As it turns out, the seemingly natural category of species ultimately amounts to population divisions that are made in order to answer quite specific scientific questions. Species categoriza categorizations, in other words, are constructed to help us understand the natural world. The concept of species is not simply biological or naturally given, and the related notion of species typical behavior or functioning doesn't pick out necessarily immutable traits or characteristics, although judgments about these behaviors or characteristics are based in part on evolved biological capacities, but that's only in part. Um, so this is part of what really motivates me to think harder about what it is that we're talking about. We're trying to get a certain sort of understanding of who fits, who these beings are that fit in the species category. And one of the ways that we get that understanding is by what we think of as observing natural behaviors um, that the species engage in. But if the category of species isn't a natural category, and if these behaviors, and I'll say more about this in a minute, aren't consistent across organisms within that group or population, um, then it seems like what's being done, either explicitly or implicitly, is a kind of um, projection of an essential capacity or essential um, characteristics. And this was talked about earlier, and it's something that I want to 
um, really challenge or steer away from. So appreciating the species concept that the species concept is not fixed, um, that it's not uh, a natural concept is important given the related concepts, as I just said, of species typicality. Um, and so one of the things that the use of species typicality does is in, um, sort of tend to get um, some theorists who use the notion, um, it tends to import this notion of normalcy. If species itself is a constructed concept to describe a population, it doesn't make sense then to say that there's a normal way to describe the bodies or behaviors of animals that currently are classified as members of that same species. Um, and so, I mean, this is something that we, we saw 50 years ago, really, as feminist philosophers and, of science and feminist science study scholars started looking at sort of what was happening in primatology and the way that certain cisgendered, able-bodied white men would go out to watch, let's say, gorillas or chimpanzees or other um, primates and come back with what seemed to be natural behaviors, but was really filtered through their own um, biases and their own sensibilities. So assertions of normal, what's normal for chimps, what's normal for gorillas, what's normal for monkeys, what's normal for us, um, are illicitly included in the arguments that certain bodies have capacities that should be exercised and certain behaviors um, that are more valuable than others. And this is, I'm, I'm going to just kind of have to go over this part without going into too much detail, but this is a very big trend within animal ethics. The idea that we could somehow identify these capacities, that they're normal capacities, and it's based on those capacities that we then elevate or don't elevate certain individuals to a kind of moral status. But typical, the, the notion of typicality or the word typical needn't provide cover for the normal. Um, and this, again, I owe um, to Shelley for reminding me of Ron Edmondson's um, suggestion that a typical trait may just be the least unusual and an atypical trait need not be quote unquote abnormal. So understood in this way, the discussion of typical and atypical traits can occur without assuming that they're respectively normal or abnormal. So within a constructed species category, there are a variety of behaviors and a variety of morphologies and how that variety is characterized is gonna depend on the perspective of those doing the characterization. The desire for a concept like species typicality in the case of animals is important though, because learning about what they want and need depends in large part on an understanding of what they typically do. Species may not usually be the right level at which to make such observations, maybe genus or family um, is more important in terms of biological classifications of behaviors and morphology. Um, but they can be an informative nonetheless. So consider parrots. Um, parrots, like the majority of flighted birds, enjoy flying. One of the most egregious things about holding parrots and other birds in captivity is that they're denied the opportunity to fly. There's an estimated 40 million parrots that suffer in captivity in the US alone in part because they're denied the freedom to fly. They can become self-injurious and quite difficult to live with. Um, they're also difficult to live with because they're in captivity and, and um, they don't really fully adapt to that lifestyle, even if they were born into captivity. But parrots who are smuggled into the country from the wild suffer from the trauma of capture, the loss of their families, and the terror of transport, adding insult to captive injury. Thousands of parrots are surrendered to small sanctuaries. Um, they can't keep up with the need for placement. And even when in a sanctuary, their ability to fly is curtailed. So some parrots and other birds may adjust to their captivity. They may form strong bonds with the humans who love them and other animals who live with them, but they don't all lose their desire to fly. Many parrots born in captivity never have had the pleasure of flight. And many, it turns out, and I didn't know this, um, don't know how to use their wings to fly if they haven't been able to do that. 
One way these issues has tied me up in knots is how to talk about the embodied harms without doing that essentializing move, um, without saying, for example, as my students have recently said when we were discussing this in class, that it's, you, you can't really say that flighted birds were quote unquote meant to fly. That's the essentializing move. But it's a very important move within a large um, amount of animal literature at the moment. In fact, Martha Nussbaum has a new book coming out in which this is really front and center, this capabilities approach that there are these, these essential characteristics that it must be expressed. And if an animal can't express these species typical essential characteristics, we are doing them harm, whether they sort of experience it, it as a harm or not is another interesting question. So when a wild flighted bird who did fly can no longer fly, um, it does seem reasonable to think that something has been lost. Many years ago, I uh, rescued a duck who was frozen. Uh, one of her wings was frozen to a river. So I sort of shimmied my way out onto the river with some uh, warm water. Um, hoping that the, hoping the ice wouldn't break with my from my weight, and so that I could release her where she certainly would have either been eaten by a predator or starved. Um, and so I brought her to the veterinarian when I when I got her off of um, the ice, and uh, the vet said that there would be no way to repair her wing. Um, so I invited Duck, as I ended up calling her, um, to recover in my bathtub, and. When spring arrived, I made a coop for her outside. During the day, she would wander around with my uh, the dog that I lived with at the time, Dooley, instructing him to dig holes in different places um, so that she could extract grubs and worms and, and what have you. And at night, I'd put her back into the coop um, so that she would be protected from predators. So often what I observed um, when Duck was living with me was what that when birds were flying overhead, she would sometimes stop what she was doing and sort of look up, I should mention her, the same um, side that her wing was broken. Um, her eye didn't work um, either. It must've been harmed or frozen. Um, maybe it's possible she was shot by a, um, duck hunters and, and didn't um, just got injured and didn't get killed. Um, Anyway, she looked, she would look up and it was always a little bit for, from the eye that was a good eye for her. And um, she would um, look at the birds flying overhead. And that, that made me um, wonder what she was thinking about. I think she certainly missed the company of other birds. Um, she ultimately left the yard one day, returning to the river. Um, it was warm at the time. And I saw her that she had taken up with a pair of geese. One was wild and one was seemingly domesticated. And sort of after this sort of queer triplet um, got together, I never really saw um, her or them again. So whether Duck actually despaired that she was unable to fly is something I don't really presume to know, but I can imagine that losing that ability was akin to um, an ability that a friend of mine had after she experienced a terrible bicycle accident, which caused a severe spinal cord injury. Um, that left her with quadriplegia. And both Duck and my human friend certainly adjusted to their loss, but it's important, and this is what's the vexation for me, um, it seems that to register their losses as losses without normalizing or naturalizing their prior abilities. Um, and so how to do that? Well, one way I've been toying with this and somewhat controversially is by looking at Jasper Poir's discussion of debilitation. Um, so Poir intervenes in a particular, what she refers to as this overly binary understanding of disability um, and highlights importantly, the significant of impact of both context and access in particular environments. Um, in the deployment of different concepts. So rather than thinking of species typicality in let's say idealized or naturalized ways that is often done within animal ethics, we can focus on the context and the very uh, variegated ways in which certain collections of, cap of capacity and ability are created. So another way of putting what I'm think tr thinking through here is something um, about what Shelley 
um, and others call the apparatus of disability, that the structures that create um, the conditions as opposed to the naturalized bodies without in making those bodies um, sort of abstract um, or um, removed. So the conditions, I think, of life and death for the um, bro in broiler chickens makes this kind of debilitation um, and these structures particularly vivid. And it's interesting to follow up on the talk about eating. Um, so I'm sorry, this is gonna be kind of harsh description of, of raising chickens um, who are consumed. Um, so the conditions of life and death for the approximately 9 billion broiler chickens who are created, raised, and slaughtered every year just in the United States is a stark example of the production of what I, I'm calling, and I think Sonny Taylor would call captive disability. These birds are genetically engineered to quickly grow extremely large breasts. Their small legs often can't hold them up. Um, they're terribly unbalanced and many chickens fall over into um, this sort of ammonia soaked flooring um, that burns through their fe feathers and burns through their skin. Um, it's this burning ammonia that comes from their waist. Their hearts and lungs are often all overtaxed, so will fail due to their disabled bodies and their extreme living conditions. Hundreds of thousands of birds at a time spend their shortened lives in windowless warehouses packed wing to wing, and those that suffer heart attacks or can't get up due to the weight of their bodies are trampled to death often by other birds. As Sonny Taylor um, suggests, quote, what does it mean to speak of a healthy or normal chicken when they all live in environments that are profoundly disabling? That's from her 2017 book, Be Suburban. Their bodily disfigurations, their suffering and their early deaths are impacted by both human supremacism, what often gets called speciesism, but that's a topic for another paper, um, and ableism. Humans too are altered by certain disabling conditions, such as the result, those that result from environmental injustices, for example. So exposure to dioxin in neighborhoods under and adjacent to major highways, toxic waste in communities built to over Superfund sites, lead paint in homes and schools, air and water pollution from manure put pits of factory farms. Many poor communities of color are exposed to disabling environmental toxins and are unable to move away from those neighborhoods um, for all sorts of reasons, leading to increased vulnerability to disablement and premature death. Prisons are site of a variety of injustices, um, including environmental injustices. Prisoners are at heightened risks of exposure to toxic chemicals, contaminated water, rancid food, extreme temperatures, poor air quality, and inadequate medical care. Prisoners who work are often forced to do the most dirty and dangerous jobs that are exempt from occupational health and safety regulations. And as a result of these de de debilitating environmental conditions, as well as profound emotional distortions that come from having one's relationships with loved ones and more open, less controlled space severed, many prisoners become disabled. The particular conditions that lead to debilitation are proper sites for criticism, I believe. The disability that results from these conditions of dehumanization and de-animalization can also be criticized and judged undesirable, but these are particular judgments made from those impacted. Such judgments do not rest on claims, I, I hope, that animals and people are being treated in ways that are quote unquote unnatural or abnormal, but that these institutions are designed to cause this kind of suffering. It's actually that these institutions are normal. They're doing what they were supposed to do, harm, violence. So many lives are shattered by cruelty, by the violence and the institutionalized debilitation that one would be remiss not to recognize and protest um, the losses that these institutions precipitate. But protesting conditions that are debilitating is not the same as making judgments about what's normal and what's abnormal. We might say, for example, that duck's life that the lives of genetically modified broiler chickens, the lives of prisoners, could have been better 
had they not been exposed to disabling conditions and environments without diminishing in any way the value of their lives as lived. The emphasis here is on recognizing and trying to alter debilitating conditions, particularly systemic structural conditions that cause so much injury, harm, and loss. So let me briefly expand on the idea of dehumanization as a way of illustrating that it isn't simply those in favor of, let's say, justice for animals who often fail to recognize the complexity of the categories they invoke, but to show that disability scholars too, and advocates, um, disability rights advocates also grapple with the difficult conceptual questions around species as well. So Harriet McBride Johnson's announcement after her much discussed meeting with Peter Singer reveals that um, this particular kind of um, failure to, to engage and interrogate these species troubles. Um, and I obviously, Singer's problems we know about, we'll just put them on hold for the minute. Um, she writes um, as, quote, as a disability pariah, I must struggle for a place, for kinship, for community, for connection, because I'm still seeking acceptance of my humanity. Because she's still seeking acceptance of her humanity, the call to get past species seems a luxury that she found beyond her reach. Of course, the idea that one has to achieve their humanity is not new. Being compared to animals is part of the violent conceptual and rhetorical strategies that prevent some members of our species from being seen or incorporated into the worthy category of the human. Placing people in a lower category of subhuman or not quite human is a way of maintaining a hierarchy of worth that puts certain humans, usually cisgendered able-bodied white men at the top, these are similar to those that are similar to them um, or on a rug in, rung in the hierarchical ladder right below them. Um, and there's an ugly history of denying some people inclusion in the, in the human category altogether. Thankfully, this is getting taken up in a much more um, prominent way lately. Um, the point has been made really powerfully um, within recent work on anti-Blackness and also on animality that where Claire Jean Kim describes how scientific racism operates in these hierarchical fictions. Um, and um, also uh, two uh, sisters, Black vegan scholars, Silco and Afco um, have also been highlighting um, some of these problems. They write, racism is simultaneously anti-Black and anti-animal as seen by racial ideologies, elevation and celebration of the human and humanities, particularly as Western and white. So when humans are compared to animals, it tends to be to make the point about their, un, their lowly and uncivilized behavior. These scholars are, are, are really clear on that as is um, Zakia Jackson in her recent work. It's not that black people and animals have been compared to each other, but rather that it's necessary to link black people to animals in order to maintain the hierarchy um, that's racialized with whites on top. As long as there's an idea that there should be a hierarchy of worth and that animals are lower on that hierarchy, so thus valued less, comparing black people to animals is a direct strategy to value them less. And it isn't just black people who are linked to animals in this exercise of power. Lisa Gunther's discussion of the dehumanizing and de-animalizing conditions that prisoners of all races endure in solitary confinement can also help us think about the very ideas of the human and how the very ideas of the human and the animal are subject to room, not only through hierarchical thinking, but by its material manifestations, its debilitating manifestations in captive institutions. This de-animalization of human beings is quite familiar from the institution, from the rhetoric of the institutionalization of disabled people. Comparing disabled people with animals was not only a way of again dehumanizing them, but also served as a justification to confine them, isolate them, and keep them from meaningful, joyous intercorporeal experiences. And that continues. Rather than trying to proclaim that we too are human, and thereby assuming and reinforcing the elevated status of an allegedly natural category, instead 
we need to recognize that human is a category of power deployed to disenfranchise, disrespect, and keep others, racialized and disabled humans, as well as animals, in undignified, lesser positions, subject to all sorts of violence and harm. Challenging these social categories that undergird the status hierarchies is, I think, a more liberatory approach to disability justice than exclusively working for inclusion. Um, and many disability scholars already um, know that, I learned that from them. Thinking of acting in solidarity with others who occupy the lower rungs in a social hierarchy is a way to build strength to topple it. Of course, it's completely understandable um, for Harriet Johnson um, and others to seek acceptance of their humanity um, but since this inevitably involves excluding others in the current social order, others like animals who are objectified, denied dignity, and forced to ex endure extreme violence, challenging the social categories and the mechanisms that surveil them may ultimately provide more relief for disabled people, for incarcerated people, for animals, and for lower, so-called lower ranking others. Okay, I'll stop there. We could have a conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Lori. Everybody uh, in the audience, uh, please put your questions in the Q and A, and I will read them out. And you can use the chat for discussion with each other. But I will be looking in the Q and A for questions. And since there are none yet. Um, I, I, I will ask uh, a question. Uh, so I, I, I really, I, I liked this observation about sort of humanness being used to sort of draw a boundary around who, who deserves our care and who is outside of our care. Um, I have a question about, uh, so, so I, I was noticing also that like comparing people to members of a denigrated group is not just something that is done across the human animal, like to denigrate them is not just something that's done across the human animal boundaries. So like comparing men to women as a way of denigrating them or comparing people to like a racialized minority are both, uh, or, or, or in fact, comparing people to, to like disabled people um, are, are all ways of denigrating them. And I thought an interesting kind of difference between those and the human animal boundary is that uh, there is sort of more ambiguity with respect to all of those other boundaries. Like there are people, or there, there are like, I guess individuals, right? I genuinely like can't say which side of the boundary they fall on and their anxiety is kind, can be kind of used as, as fuel for propping up an existing social order. Uh, I wasn't so sure that there was uh, such ambiguity with human versus non-human because for reasons that like might well be unsavory and like I think we don't know much about like that uh, kind of nearby, like the near the nearest non-human species to us now are, are ape species and, and all the nearby hominids um, kind of have perished. Do you think that that like greater like clarity of boundary has any effect on how this distinction is is deployed and propping up social hierarchies? So I think that, the, I mean, that's a really important question. And I think that there is a sense in which what I'm trying to struggle against here is this idea that we have, that somehow it's, um, that there's a sort of, um, we pretend, I want to say we pretend, we pretend that there's a sort of easy way to identify all humans as humans, when at least historically, and even in the contemporary context, that's not really the true, not really true. And I started, and maybe it wasn't clear, by suggesting that there is this notion that all humans are valued higher than non-humans, and that's also not actually true. So what I'm pushing against is this notion that's somehow easier in one realm than the other. I want to push against that commonsensical framework. So I, I get what you're saying. I think it's how we're trained, how we think, but I want to push against it to say, actually, no, um, there are a lot of humans that are dehumanized and de-animalized. Um, 
in their humanness. And that's really worth thinking through. These categories aren't these fixed, immutable, clear categories, um, that there's all sorts of um, normative cooking in that category, as it were. Um, and so that's what I want to push back against. Um, that's the species trouble. And so, um, I, I mean, I think, yes, you're right. I mean, I think on the one hand, this is a commonsensical, you know, way of thinking about it. Um, but I'm trying to suggest that, ah, but what do we, is it really, how, what's really going on there? Are we, are we basing that on not just, let's call it empirically faulty um, observations, but also conceptually problematic observations? Uh, thank you. We have a question from Jonathan. Thanks so much. Um, so, so I have to resist asking you the same questions I've asked you before on these <laughs> topics, but uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to fall into the same trap again. And, and uh, apologies if uh, if you covered this, but it just occurred to me again as, as you were talking. But um, there are many comparisons we make with animals um, out of pride. So, so lions, eagles, um, and I was beginning to think, well, do we only compare ourselves with animals that eat other animals or prey on other animals, certain categories in this positive way? Um, but, but then I thought, well, well, would anyone refer to themselves as a dove, I wonder? So we, we do talk about people as being doves or you know, hawks, be doves. So it's just quite interesting to that there is quite a lot of positive uh, animal um, comparisons, metaphors, and also things that are admiring without necessarily being negative or admiring in some way. So if you call someone a shark, then um, that is saying you know, maybe they're very good at business, but that's not an admirable trait. So um, I don't suppose it was part of your thesis that you know, any comparison with an animal is denigrating. I, no, I, yeah. I, I mean, I think partly what I wanted to get at here is that um, there's there's two two simultaneous things happening. Um, this is the double problem, and so one of the one of the things that's happening is that we are imagining that we can attribute certain capacities or traits to animals. And that that makes up that animal, those traits do. Um, that's sort of the idea about normalcy. This is, or these traits belong to these animals. And it's a very, again, going back to Ray's important question, it's something we're taught to do. So what I'm trying to do is something kind of undermine a very commonsensical way of thinking. And so that's what I'm trying to problematize or trouble the very idea of species typicality. And so... Um, when we put these certain desirable or undesirable traits on animals, that's the first mistake, right? That we somehow get these, that these traits fit on these animals. That leads to all sorts of problems. What if, what if you see, for example, I, I mean, I, this is fictitious totally, but, you know, a pacifist lion, I don't know if there's such a thing, right? But a non-predatory lion. Um, what happens is we rule out the very possibility Right. Mm -hmm. Or we undermine the atypical um, morphology or behaviors because we attribute certain kinds of traits or characteristics and the values that are associated with those with animals. So that's what I'm getting at. So it's not to say that a comparison with an animal is always going to be a negative comparison, but there's a mistake that is being made by assuming that we can make a generalization about capacities or traits of the animal. That's the first thing. But the second thing, and this is about the hierarchies, the second part of this is that when we have these categories that need to be troubled, we rank these categories in this great chain of being, right? Or however that gets ranked. And we see that it's not all humans that matter or that it's not all humans that are at the top and all animals at the bottom, but there's a lot of variability here. But it's the fact that we have the hierarchy and that variability that allows us to bring some humans downward. That's what some of the recent literature um, that Claire Kim and the Coes and Zakia Jackson are doing. They're trying to show that, um, that these kinds of hierarchical structures 
are propping up the devaluation of certain others. So again, that's not to say that it's bad traits in certain animals that exist that bring down some. Um, I hope that answers your question, Joe. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question in the Q&A from Audrey Yap, who writes, thanks for this amazing talk, Laurie. Uh, this is not a super well-formed question, but I'd love to hear you say more about something that only came up a bit tangentially during the talk. One of the many things that contributes to the debilitation of so many captive animals is the selective breeding that happens to produce boiler chickens with the kind of characteristics that you describe or docile dairy cows, and so on. Where with humans, there's always the specter of eugenics and breeding out or engineering out disability. And I wonder if there's more specific to be discussed along those lines. Wow, that's a great question, Audrey. And it's kind of huge. It's a huge question. Um, I think that um, there's a lot of really interesting and important um, work being done on as we talked about earlier, um, is often talked about on the kind of um, eugenic qualities. And I think there's two important things about thinking about um, the relationship between institutionally used um, and institutionally bred animals and its relation to um, you know, some of the awful things that you mentioned that go under often the name of um, enhancement right, in the sort of, um, to my mind, really problematic literature in bioethics. Um, so from the point of view, so what is an enhancement? Well, it depends on your point of view. This is part of what I was getting at earlier in the talk. Um, there aren't any, I think, obvious essential traits that we can draw on about human a non-human life. Um, I think that what ends up happening is some traits get elevated to the normal um, or sort of a normal, a normative notion of the typical. And I think in the case of, you know, a lot of broiler chickens, for example, um, they don't look anything like their, you know, the, the kinds of of chickens that they came, jungle fowl that they came from, um, but they do exist as those beings now. Um, and they, you know, if they're at sanctuary and they reproduce, they reproduce themselves. So they're they're not their modification was germline modification. So they are who they are now. Um, same thing with the dairy cows. Same thing with actually um, cows that are used for beef, um, and also actually with pigs, they're doing this as well. So that kind of genetic modification is creating a new type of being. Um, and then within that being, within that category, there's all sorts of ways of thinking about whether those traits are quote unquote typical or atypical. And I think the similar kind of thing um, can be said, I mean, I'm always thinking about some sort of not so distant future science fiction where um, traits that would be potentially concerning um, get produced in large ways um, amongst human populations and it changes it, the meaning changes in terms of the context and in ter terms of the content. I don't know if that was a satisfactory answer because um, I think it's a huge question, but I do think that um, there's a lot to be said about the connections between genetic engineering and eugenics in the case of animals and in the case of humans. So we have a question from RJ Flynn, who has submitted in the chat for reasons of Q&A being ill-behaved. Um, mm. So RJ Flynn writes, Lori, can you explain how you're using de-animalize? To say that some humans are dehumanized and de-animalized seems somewhat conflicting. Okay, so the way that I'm using de-animalize, and that's a really important question, and I didn't get into the details for time, um, but it's a it's a question that um, I think I first got um, thinking about de-animalization from Lisa Gunther's important work in 2012 in her um, 
project on solitary confinement. And what she argues, and I think this is really, really powerful, is that there are certain kinds of conditions that you can, captive conditions, that you can put an, a being into that not only um, strips them of their humanity, as it were, um, whereby you might think of dignity or worth or something like that, but also strips them of their sociality or their corporality. So um, one of the things that she argues is that um, solitary confinement and what she calls sens sensory deprivation, which is something that happens to animals in laboratories, but also in factory farms and other institutions of use, um, that, that is a way that to take a living being um, who has sensory experiences and to twist or distort or harm or um, debilitate the capacity to experience those things, to make those experiences problematic. That's what de-animalization does. It's sort of part of my struggle, part of my vexation in this, in this work is to try to think through the ways in which our shared embodiment, which is only the embodiment that's shared, not the experiences of the embodiment, but the shared embodiment matters in thinking about how to criticize institutions that are debilitating. I don't know if that if that helps to explain um, or please please ask further um, if that didn't get at what I meant by de-animalization. And we have uh, time left. So please feel free to either raise your hand if you're a panelist or submit a question to the Q&A if you're in the audience. Uh, I also have a, another question um, while I'm waiting for other people to ask questions, uh, which is about sort of uh, subjective welfare as an alternative to species typical welfare. So I think that this is like very intuitive in humans. Like you just, if you wanna know what's good for people, you ask them what they want and let them decide. And I think it also makes sense for animals and, and there are people like Heather Browning who defend it as a, as a conception of animal welfare. Because even though you can't talk to animals, you can observe what they try to do and when they show signs of distress. Um, do you think that that's a viable alternative or part of a viable alternative? So I think that there's a lot to be said for um, subjective welfare as one piece of a bigger picture. Um, I think that we know from all sorts of um, all sorts of literature across social psychology, philosophy, cognitive science, that people aren't very good at understanding their subjective welfare, um, primarily because of conceptual um limitations or conceptual constrictions um in the human case but also in the case of um animals there's a translation problem um but i think i do think that there is part that's part of a larger picture there's also a lot of danger associated with just talking about um subjective welfare outside of conditions looking at these larger conditions um, that make certain populations prone to less opportunities for subjective welfare, as it were. So um, it's an interesting piece of a larger problem, um, a larger picture, I think. Uh, Leisha Carlson has a question. Hi, Lori. Thank you so much for your paper. Um, so this is getting at something that I've been wrestling with for a very long time. I've written on this, um, but I guess uh, sort of one short comment and then a question. So um, you were talking about this double problem, the problem of essentializing categories, and then also the problem of the hierarchy. And I guess um, it seems to me, and I know um, Sonara Taylor and, and Alice have talked about this. Um, I guess I would just want to say that in my view, I think we can also disin you know, distinguish between those two problems. And I think it's possible to critique certain types of essentializing moves um, and yet at the same time not fall prey to, um, to a hierarchical view. Um, and so I guess what's behind this is my concern um, that in, in kind of 
challenging forms of animalizing people with disabilities and specifically let's say people with um you know certain intellectual or developmental disabilities um those are at least i've called them forms of, of sort of animalization and the reason that they're problematic in my view is not that it's because I think animals are lower on the hierarchy. It's a question of a mode of treatment. So maybe we need to get rid of the word animalization. And so then I guess my question is, um, can one have a critique of dehumanization without a kind of robust, meaningful, and potentially liberatory conception of the human? So in other words, when we talk about arguing against dehumanization, uh, the quandary in wanting to resist essentialism is what does the word human mean in our critique of dehumanization? So I guess I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that, because that's sort of a, a quandary I've been wrestling with yeah, in a way I, that doesn't fall prey to some hierarchical notion of human above animal or even an exclusionary definition of of human. Right. I mean, thank you. And I do appreciate your work on this. And um, and I think that's a really important question. I think about dehumanization and de-animalization as a type of um injury or violence that comes from institutions that are dehumanizing and de-animalizing. Um, what that means is there's certain kinds of ways of treating certain kinds of beings that um, the that is debilitating for those beings. That's part of what I'm getting at. And, and that's not, I'm, I don't mean to be suggesting that there aren't differences as in my other work, I'm very sort of keen on, on attending to difference. So it's not, I'm not meaning to flatten out differences amongst, you know, these categories or these populations. I'm trying really, as I was saying to Ray earlier, I'm trying to push back on some of the conceptual apparatus, as it were, that we're using to make sense of these kinds of arguments. So I'm, I'm sort of taking this meta position to argue against these these particular terms that aren't challenged in a lot of the literature. So I don't think there's some sort of flat understanding or meaning that we can make out of human, even though we can talk about the conditions in this particular instance as being dehumanizing. Right. So I think I don't I think that's the confusion or potential problem is that, well, wait, if you're going to say that's dehumanizing, you must have a sense of what the list of humanizing traits are. And that's the move I want to try to get. This is why it's so vexing and I'm still at it because it's really hard. Um, but I'm trying to figure out what it is that um, how we can still make these critiques that are dehumanizing and de-animalizing without invoking a kind of static species category. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Naomi Shaman, who asks, do you see any connections between this sense of de-animalization and the de-animalizing characteristic of pri privileged subjectivity, distancing of the rational self from embodiment? Oh, perfect. What a great question, Naomi. Um, that is, I, I, um, obviously I'm, I'm responding to it really positively. So I see a connection. I haven't thought through that positive side of things, but I think, yes, um, that really does. Um, it, it brings to mind for me, um, important ecofeminist critiques of the division between sort of, um, reason and emotion or reason and nature. And I'm thinking too of some of Donna Haraway's early work too on sort of um, nature cultures um, and how these things get um, divided. And so the idea is that by making those hierarchical divisions, which I think still are hierarchical divisions, um, we are also losing something um, in that divide. I'm not quite sure that the blending, you know, the the nature culture blending um, is the right conceptual move um, to make. I would have to think a little bit more about that, but I definitely, I think this is really something um, important um, at the at the top end as opposed to um, at the end of um, these violent injurious institutions, the privileged side, there's also something that goes terribly wrong there. Yeah. 
So I have an anonymous question in the Q&A. Um, so the questioner uh, asks if you're doing any thinking around the ethics of disidentification with human identity and how that could relate here, really on any level, but notably within subcultures such as other, other kin or even void punk. And they say, that I'm gonna do my best to define the latter here, but a somewhat sardonic slash subversive yet sincere reclaiming of a dehumanized or often vague non-human status as a way of rejecting not just one's own humanity, but the entire politics and oppression, oppressive machinations of dehumanization itself, which is commonly, if not exclusively, done by disabled or neurodivergent folks. Yeah. Wow, that's a fantastic, fantastic question. Um, and I'm really, I haven't done as much thinking um, about it as um, I'd like to. It's a really, really um, good question. Um, I, you know, I think the the old incarnation of furries is one particular kind of manifestation. I, I was at dinner with um, some non-binary friends of mine a while ago who were describing me as trans species or trans animal as opposed to transgendered. Um, as and that was a compliment. It wasn't it wasn't a criticism, and it was sort of a um, I took that really well. I think there's a lot to be said, and it's. It is in some ways the kind of opening that I think the kind of conceptual, um, metaphysical, if you will, um, deconstruction that I'm trying to do will could lead to in a way, a different way of valuing identifications and uh, affiliative belonging from a variety of different um, embodied experiences. I think it's a really great question. Uh, so we are, at time, uh, I think so. If schedule says we end at 20 past the hour and we're slightly over time. Uh, thank you so much, Lori, and thank you much, so much, uh, Shelly and Jonathan and Jamie for, for all the organizing. Yeah, thank you all. And uh, Lori and Ray, thank you so much for a wonderful session to close off the day today. Um, yes, so thank that you so is, much. Yeah. And um, so th that is the end of the day for today, but we have two more days. Uh, so we're only halfway through. It's been amazing. And I hope many of you will be able to return tomorrow or on Friday or both, although we understand people have very busy lives. And we're uh, very grateful for people taking time out of their schedule to come and um, hear and support our speakers. So, um, on that note, unless Shelley, is there anything you want to add for today? Um, I'm again. I'm staying off screen today um, because of um, where I'm situated in my place. But um, uh, no, I just wanted to reiterate that the presentations over the past two days have been um, fantastic and really provocative and really um, informed and really. Uh, um, potentially um revolutionary i think so i'm i'm really grateful to everyone who's participated thus far and who will be participating thank you very much okay and thank you so for, we, thank you to jamie who's who's been really helping me out um in terms of um uh you know, putting notes in the in the chat about um, uh, in answer to questions and uh, um, about live tweeting. I really appreciate that, and I want to acknowledge that. Okay, well, well, thank you to everyone, and um, enjoy the rest of your day, uh, whatever part portion of the day it is you've got ahead of you now. So, um, see many of you tomorrow, and on that, I think we will close the session for today, but last round of applause for the speakers.